and what was the emotional state of Wendy and her parents? What was what was it like when you saw them that next day? Um, it was the same day that he passed, and I I think you know um, there was some some things that felt off about that interaction um, in her house, and um, and it was very troubling to me. Welcome to a special edition of Surviving the Survivor, the Dan Markell murder with Carm on crime. So, Carm, uh, a little tension in the air today on the drive over. Nothing unusual for us. Uh, I basically told you that you were causing paralysis in my life, and uh, you told me to go f myself. Just another day in in the life in the life of us. And then when I went to use the bathroom before the podcast, you were uh, confessing to the audio engineer. I wasn't confessing. I was getting support you, from him. You were telling on me, and he basically said I had to take accountability in my own life. Uh, the 19- Totally sided with me. The 19-year-old is correct. So at 53, I should probably stop blaming you for things. But you know what? Today is not about me or you. Oh. Today is actually a, a pretty solemn day in a lot of ways. It is what should have been Dan Markell's 50th birthday uh, today, uh, 50 years old. Uh, instead, family members are still mourning. Ruth Markell, who I just spoke with, Dan's lovely mother, his father, Phil, his sister, Shelly, uh, much of the world who knows about the story. And uh, who better to memorialize Dan and speak about him as a person than two of his good friends? So, Without further ado, we are joined today by, up on the left corner of your screen, if you're listening, pretend it's the left corner, uh, Tamara Demko, as well as Jeremy Cohen, who both live in Tallahassee and were both uh, friends with Dan. So, Tamara, um, how did you get to meet Dan, uh, and what was your very initial impression of him, your first impression? I met Dan in 1997 on my first day of Harvard Law School. Um, We were divided into groups of 150 back then and then into a smaller group called an A group of 15 students. And Dan was in my 15 student group, my A group. Um, We we worked on different projects together. And my first impression of him was that he was very well-spoken, very smart and, uh, and funny as well. And Tamara, are you currently a lawyer? Um, You're obviously a lot smarter than me, but what are you doing these days? I am an actively licensed attorney. I I only do pro bono work. I'm not practicing. Uh, I work in healthcare policy and consulting, and I'm also a nurse. And my, my practice spans really public health, nursing, and law as well. And you don't necessarily think of two Harvard law grads ending up in Tallahassee. I mean, was there, what was, what brought you to Tallahassee? We know what brought Dan. For me, I came in with the Charlie Crist administration and I served as the assistant deputy secretary for health at the Florida Department of Health. It was an opportunity to, to look at the policy side and to look at healthcare from a governmental perspective. Carm, is it just me or when you speak to people that graduated from Harvard, especially Harvard Law graduate school, you feel a little uneasy, like, you know, like you're going to say something dumb or act dumb? Something is wrong with me. Definitely something is wrong with me because I don't feel uneasy at all. You don't? No. So you feel like you could hang with Tamara when it comes to understanding the law? Like you... No. If you went to law school at the same time as Tamara at Harvard Law, you'd No, think but you'd... Tamara couldn't hang with somebody who went to, to study rocket science. Your, your granddaughter, as a matter of fact, at MIT. But, I, no, but... I, I digress for a moment. That's my own insecurities. But, Jeremy, um, you, how, how did you, uh, you get to meet Dan? Um, and same question, first impression of Dan. Sure. So um, my wife and I met Danny and Wendy at the same time um, at a party. We went to a mutual friend's house in 2008, and uh, it was a large party. We knew you know a fair amount of people there, and we just kind of uh, found Wendy and Danny and ended up sitting down and talking to them for like an hour, um, just uh, the four of us. And uh, after that, we we you know connected up and started our friendship. But in terms of first impressions, um, interestingly, he reminded me a lot of a younger version of my father. Uh, my dad uh, was a law professor, criminal law professor 
um, for decades uh, at the University of Tennessee. And he had a, a spark about him and an excitement about the law about him that was really uh, reminiscent of my dad. And it, it was, it was you know, he's a fun person to hang out with and, and uh, banter with. And um, so I really enjoyed that first conversation. Jeremy and I have a bond. He's he's the black sheep of his family, if I may well, call you that. I, I, I'm sure he does. His father was a law professor. But, my father is a he, physician. My sister's a doctor. My brother in law everyone's do a you, doctor. Do I'm you do, identify do you identify as the black sheep? Of course sheep? not. Honestly. Course I not. do. I, I uh, both of my brothers <laughs> are lawyers. I'm the only non lawyer in my family. I, my wife and I own a business here and we're and we're the black sheep for sure. Well, oh my God! Nah, I don't. Uh, I think. I think you have to come f- for counseling to me, all of you. No, Jeremy. Definitely. Jeremy went with. Jeremy went where the money is. He's the smart guy, obviously. Um, so, let me ask you: How difficult uh, to marry for you? How difficult is this day? I mean, it's a pretty poignant day of remembrance. Fifty years is a big milestone. Um, what are you feeling on a day like today? Well, I feel grateful, first of all, that you're having us here remembering Danny and uh, and his life and his legacy and really grateful for his life and his memory on this day. Um, I can't believe he would have been 50. We probably would have joked around about that quite a bit. Um, there would have been some creative ways to say happy birthday. He would take parts of people's names and change it up. So he might say happy Bam Bizzle D Mizzle. For example, <laughs> um, <laughs> so he would he would find a way to make it funny, but uh, I'm sure there would have been a, a fantastic gathering and party. And um, I'm just grateful that that we can remember him together, and that people around the world who are listening to this and thinking of him today can can cherish those memories. And uh, I, I did a. I always do my research, even though sometimes it doesn't seem that way. And Tamara is one of two Tamaras in her small class at Harvard Law in that little breakout class. Oh. And it was Dan who started to call you by your first and middle initial, right? So he called you TJ. Is that right? He called me TJ. He had a lot of friends, Tamara, Tamar. And he said, oh, let me just make this easy. Well, what's your middle name? Okay, TJ. So that was day one. <laughs> he changed my name on the first day I met him. And uh, Jeremy, for you, uh, today, Dan's 50th birthday, wh- what, what, what does your heart tell you on uh, today? Well, I, I certainly I miss my friend, and I, I appreciate you shining a spotlight on him and, and his memory today. Um, I know that, uh, you know, as much as we all can do to help um, keep his, his uh, memory fresh and celebrate his life, I think uh, we're all better for it. Um, one thing that it, this actually this day reminds me of being his 50th is I remember well going to his 40th birthday celebration and uh, Tamara I'm not sure if you were there or not but it was um, in terms of the timing of it it was a few months after um, Wendy and Danny had split and you know he hosted people at his house and half the furniture was gone and Danny was in a you know a sad dark place but we wanted to be there for him and celebrate this milestone of his 40th birthday and it was a really kind of emotionally draining birthday party where we all were trying to do our best to lift him up and uh, celebrate him and be there for him on his birthday but he had a whole lot weighing on him and there was kind of a dark cloud over that house on that day so um, it's bringing back that memory for sure and jeremy how do you think uh, the way things were going and the trajectory he was on how do you think his 50th birthday would have been because he was getting life his life back on track he had a girlfriend um he had obviously gone through the divorce proceedings uh up to that point how do you think his 50th would have been different than his 40th that's a great question i think i mean i i love the trajectory that he was on as as a person as a father uh, as a friend uh just you know on the day of his passing i mean and uh I think he would have continued on a really good trajectory for him and his career would have been thriving. I, you know, who knows in terms of a relationship, but yes, he was you know happy with a girlfriend at that time. And um, yeah, he would have been in a far better place on his 50th than he was on his 40th. No doubt. So Tamara, same question to you. Um, Jeremy was, you know, just mentioning Dan's 40th birthday being difficult, going through a, a divorce, uh, separating from his wife, Wendy at that time. How do you think his 50th would have been different? I think he, like Jeremy said, I think he was on a great trajectory. I think he would have 
authored a lot more papers and books and made a difference in the lives of other students and next generations of legal minds and people. And um, I think he, he had a lot contribute. And I think he would have done a whole lot during those 10 years. Um, he was on a happy path with his relationship, which made everyone happy to see. And uh, I would I would also think that for his 50th, he'd be in a good place. I'll put you both on the spot. Uh, without being able to use the word smart, brilliant, intelligent, or anything related to law in one word or up to three words, I'll give you, how would you describe Dan Tamara? Loyal. Jeremy? Isn't the best descriptor, but warm. He had a warmth about him and drew you in. And going back to that fateful day, July uh, 2014, take us back to that moment, Tamara. Where were you? What were you doing? And how did you get that news? I was working less than a mile and a half from his house when it happened. I actually didn't find out until the next day. Um, I found out in, a, in an emotionally devastating way, which was to find out on Facebook. Um, I saw a post that said something that made me think something was wrong. And simultaneously, I got an email from a law school friend who I hadn't seen for years that said, I just heard about Danny. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? Um, because it, it was known that we were friends. Um, and uh, it was it was surreal. It was very shocking news. Um, just very devastating. And, you know, you think back about like the last time you've seen someone when they're gone. And, you know, I, I had seen him. I hadn't seen him that month. He had, he had um, taken me out for dinner for my, my birthday, uh, which was June 4th, which I found out later on was potentially the night of a first attempt on his life. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, I think the shock sort of reverberates it. it the, the sadness sort of softens over time. But um, yeah, it's, it's hard to think back at that moment. I remember a lot of it because it was so impressionable. For me, it was so real. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a very, very sad, very heartbreaking moment. And Tallahassee is a tight knit small town. What kind of shadow was cast over Tallahassee as that news broke? I think because there there was not the nobody knew who was behind it for quite a while, uh, or even a direction for it. I think it was it was very confusing. It was shocking, especially that it was in broad daylight in the morning at his house. There was a feeling of of violation of safety. I think for the community and a violation of the privacy of one's home and um, a, a young father with young children. I, I think it, it cast a very dark shadow over the community. What, was there a fear at that time that, Hey, someone could be breaking into homes. You know, I better lock my door. Was it that sort of sense of fear um, initially? So, and I can't speak for everyone. I mean, it was obviously huge news as soon as it happened. And uh, there were a lot of questions being asked, but I never had the sense that it was, you know, someone on the loose that was attacking other people in Tallahassee. It always felt to me like it was an isolated incident, a targeted incident. I mean, it's happened, you know, on broad daylight in a nice neighborhood on a Friday afternoon. And uh, it, it, it didn't make sense that it would be um, someone going out to multiple homes and doing it. It seemed very, very targeted. And I want to get back to that in a moment. Before we get there, though, Jeremy, where were you on that day in July 2014? What were you doing and how did you get the news? I was at work and my wife called. We, we lived on, on Trescott on that street and uh, my wife had uh, run home for lunch and she saw police tape up and had to turn around and go around um, to get to our house. And, and it was near Danny's house. And so she started, she called me and that kind of you know raised questions and we both started um, you know, getting online and Googling and trying to find out more. And we knew that there was a shooting on Trescott. And then uh, eventually more information came out that it was, um, that it was his house. But um, then she called the hospital and, and got confirmation that, that he was there. Um, but yeah, I was, I was standing in the, the warehouse of, at my office that day when I got that news. 
so sorry to hear that. And, and Tamara, uh, Jeremy just kind of got into it. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more. So what was, once you got the news and it kind of absorbed in a little bit for a few hours, maybe another day, who or what did you start to think was maybe behind this attack on his life? I, I think it was kind of a blur and, and a shock. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, certainly, like Jeremy said, it's, it felt like a targeted attack. I mean, such a random spot in the middle of town, like out of the way. It felt very targeted, but really had no idea. Um, you know, my concerns at that time were to, to see if other people in his life were okay. Um, including his girlfriend at the time. And I also, you know, wanted to check on Wendy at the time um, to make sure that they were doing okay. And I knew that I was in shock and grief and wanted to make sure other people were, were in a good place. Did you get a hold of Wendy uh, in the day after to when you were trying to find out if she was okay? Did you speak to her? I, I actually went to her house um, on the day that Danny passed and saw her and her parents. Um, and a couple of friends that were over that day um, to to see how they were doing. Yes, I did see her. And, and what was the emotional state of Wendy and her parents? What was what was it like when you saw them that next day? Um, it was the same day that he passed, and I I think you know it's taken me years to look back on that day to sort of really judge per- perception because I I do recognize that I was in shock, I was in grief. And so my perceptions may have been off at the time. Um, there was some some things that felt off about that interaction um, in her house, and um, and it was very troubling to me. Jeremy, I'm going to be blunt about this. I mean, they were obviously having problems in their marriage. I'm sure Dan spoke to you about it, which we can get into if you'd like to get into that. When he was killed, at any point did you say to yourself, Maybe Wendy had something to do this with this. Maybe Wendy's family had something to do with this. You know, um, I, I spoke to an investigator the day after it happened. And I mean, I told him, you know, they're throwing out you know, different scenarios. That it was tied to his work that he'd done um, or, you know, a frustrated student. And, and I knew that the, you know, only real conflict, the biggest conflict in his life by far, you know, was dealing with the, the divorce, the proceedings in the agencies. So, you know, I, I stopped short of pointing fingers at, you know, Wendy or, or you know, anyone specific in his family. But I, I knew that there was no other driving force or motive out there um, that would propel anyone to do something like this to Danny. Now, we I asked you about Dan, you know, his character. Pre-murder, when things were well between... Uh, Danny and Wendy, when you both first met Wendy, um, Tamara, what was your first impression of her? She was very charismatic, very bubbly, um, social butterfly. Um, I first met her at a law school reunion when he they were recently engaged and, and he brought her to. So I, I met her in Boston, actually, before I moved to Tallahassee. Um, very lively and certainly after after years of seeing her interact with people i mean she was she was a type of um a friend to to go from in a group of people to go from like small group to small group and sort of flutter flutter around um she might come up to you and say oh hey kids or hey friends and uh, really wanting to engage and they seemed like a like a very happy couple that was very interested in in their friends lives um, very much wanting to interact and, and very social. I mean, they, they seemed healthy at the time. Same question to you, Jeremy, your first impression of Wendy. Yeah, she was, um, I mean, just a striking person. Um, she's beautiful and smart and funny and charming and interesting. And she seemed you know, interested in you and in, in the kind of that first impression time and yeah the two of them together um they seem to have a lot of fun with each other and seem like a really happy healthy relationship um but yeah wendy was um a a very impressive person and as a first impression 
I have never heard my mother this quiet this long. I have to do a wel- welfare check. Carm, you okay? I'm I'm perfectly fine. I'm what, Carm, I, what are you most curious about? You have a curious mind as you're listening to this. No, uh, the 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 problem I have, the problem I have, and I brought it up on another podcast, and people will misunderstand this, is that I said, I know this, uh, in high school, I, I took uh, Latin, I did terribly, but I remember learning a saying that never say anything bad about the dead, okay? And, and having done marriage counseling for many years, I, I felt that the two people, the way they, they, they got together, there was something that did not work. The two personalities, the, the, the two worldviews, the two temperaments, and that I wouldn't put all the guilt on one party or the other party. It was just, part of it was the interaction, part was the personalities. But when I talk to people today, if I say the slightest thing, that like my grandchildren who are three or four, no, they know nobody's perfect. If I say something about imperfect about Dan, they, they say, you are terrible, you are a monster or something of that nature. You know, how can you say that? And I, I know that uh, there, there are people now, literally uh, groupies, who kind of paint the whole thing black and white or good and evil, you know, and, and cannot approach it. So it's a very, like, people are threading on very fine ground, not to Tre- say anything. Treading, not threading, but we get the idea. Okay, treading. So I think Carmela brings up this point. We just had the... Um, author, we just interviewed the author of uh, Extreme Punishment, um, Stephen Epstein, whose podcast will be out this Wednesday. Um, and in that book, he talks a lot about Dan's sort of obsession once the divorce proceedings uh, began. Um, and, and he was very bullish on making it, making sure that he was protected, which is what you want, and that his kids were protected. Jeremy, did did you see that side where? Dan was almost obsessive about the divorce and ruminating about it constantly and talking about it constantly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I see, I saw different phases of him. I mean, you know, there was, you know, there's a time when, when they were still married and, you know, he was happy and trying to make it work. And I, I knew that Wendy wasn't as happy, but, um, you know, I didn't see the, the divorce coming as imminently, but, um, then, you know, immediately after she, had those divorce papers on the bed and, and left. Uh, he was still all in on Wendy and really trying to salvage the relationship and bring her back and, and was, you know, making some uh, concessions to try to kind of lure her back in. And then there was a pivot there when it was clear that the divorce was moving forward. It, this you know, relationship was not salvageable. Then he pivoted to lawyer mode. And I think his scholarship you know, was put aside and his focus on his students was put aside and he went all in on, um, defending himself and his rights to, to see his children. And um, he was totally focused on this case. And yeah, he was, he, he would come over to my house, you know, after, a, you know, a big proceeding in, in the, the case and it would be there for two hours. And, you know, I would talk 5% of the time. He'd talk 95% of the time. And it was just like, he just had to get it out. There was so many, uh, you know, things happening um, in the case and so many emotions and feelings and thoughts he had it was just like a fire hose coming out of him. So, um, yeah, he really, he, that, that big smart brain of his was a hundred percent focused on this case and making sure he, he got the justice he felt like he deserved. Yeah. And Steve Epstein writes that it was almost, uh, he, he was obsessing about it so much. It was literally harming his own work at uh, FSU as a, as a law professor. But, um, Tamara, the the real victims in, in this, obviously, besides Dan, are the children. What did you have interactions with Benjamin and Lincoln, and what, what kind of boys are they? I mean, obviously, they're more grown up now. And what was Dan's relationship with the boys? I did. They were very little at the time, and I also um, have two boys. They were a little older than Ben and Lincoln, so they spent some time together. Um, he just adored those boys. They were his entire world. And he was, you know, I, I've heard 
stories of what other dads do, et cetera. But he would go and bring them snacks. He'd go and sit and have lunch with them. He was he was totally present when he was with them and and wanted to be. Um, their personalities, very cute little boys, adorable, um, worth fighting for, you know, across the board. But um, yeah, he wanted he wanted to be able to spend that time and to give the the boys the father that they deserved. So he was fighting for them actively. Um, I think he, I think Jeremy's completely spot on with what he said, but I think that Dan wanted to very much believe the best, believe that there would be a good outcome. And I've heard talk about some people say that he was a little bit oblivious about things. I think it's more that he really wanted to believe the best out of people and out of situations. Um, and he was still hopeful that they could still, they could be a family unit again. Um, and I think that's why he, in some fashion, ruminated about it so much. And also because the departure, Wendy's departure, was so unexpected and sudden. Um, but he was he was a an amazing aspirate, you know, inspirational. I should say, inspirational father to those boys. Um, and it pained me to to think that they grew up without him and his influence on their life. Yeah, I live in Miami. We've got a small That's circle of friends here. Some people know Wendy, and I've heard that the boys themselves are uh, brilliant, brilliant young kids, scoring perfectly on tests. So they definitely have inherited uh, Dan's brain power. Uh, apparently, they're, they're doing well. One of the thoughts I I had. Correct me since the two of you know know them and we are just kind of talking heads here. Uh, am I right to say that uh, as brilliant as Dan was, he was also honorable in the sense that he fought, uh, you know, a fair battle, not below the belt, you know, and that, and that he kind of had a little difficulty even relating to when the when she just pulled everything out of the the house when he was away on a trip in, in New York because that's the type of thing his honor or his self self esteem or or his whatever it is would not allow him to behave like that under any circumstances and and i think that that's when he suddenly realized that the fight is not equal because he's fighting as an honorable person and the other side is fighting a little dirty. And Carm, of course, is talking about that moment in time where Wendy basically moved out of the house while Dan was away and he comes back and everything, but I think his own bed was, was gone. And the divorce uh, papers are on, the, on lying the, on the bed. Yeah, so... He Jer wasn't prepared for that, e even though maybe he should have been prepared, but he didn't want it, so he kind of, uh, you know, with all his intelligence, he d had this blind spot that didn't realize it was coming. Yeah, Jeremy, let me ask you this. What do you think precipitated... Was there a moment in time where you sort of started to see things go south? What do you think precipitated the breakdown of the marriage? Was it... Like Carmela alluded to this earlier, was it a like a personality disparity between the two? What do you think was the ignition that caused the marriage to start to fall apart? You know, I, I'm not sure, and I don't think there's a single thing that I can point to. Um, you know, I think that Wendy was not as happy in the marriage as Danny was, and and so whenever there's an imbalance like that, I think that that's that's not healthy for any relationship. Um, and you know, there were things that Danny would would push for that I know Wendy was not supportive of. Things like you know keeping kosher in the house and and you know chores around the house and things like that. Um, and you know, but no, I, I don't know of a single thing. I know so my wife and Wendy were close. And there were times when. You know, there were, the girls would get together for lunch and they'd have some conversations. I think that Wendy would open up with, with my wife a little bit more, uh, you know, about um, how she was feeling and some frustrations that, she, that Wendy had about the relationship. But then, you know, when they were together, Wendy would always have a happy face on and you never saw any kind of cracks in that foundation. There. And that Wendy was very highly skilled at, um, you know, being, you know, the person that you wanted her to be when she was right in front of you. And then you never knew she was, she was elsewhere. But so I, I can understand why Danny didn't truly really understand that, that Wendy was unhappy. Um, 
throughout their marriage there, but at, at, towards the end, because Wendy would, would put on that good face all the time. And to marry you, do you have a hunch of when that marriage breakdown began and what precipitated it? Again, I think what Jeremy said, it's a million little things, but in my friendship with Wendy separately um, and insights, I would say that the marriage was doomed before it started. She had doubts before she got married. Um, and I think she pushed them aside. And I think some of her interviews since then, and I, I haven't listened to all of them, just clips, um, that she she pushed them aside for what she thought would be beneficial um, and what she thought would be a good decision. But that wasn't necessarily congruent with how she was feeling internally. And so I think from the very start, it was not the best match for different reasons. As Jeremy said, on the surface, it looked healthy. On the surface, it was this playful interaction. They called each other the bears and they, they had nicknames for each other. And it seemed it had all the, the essence of a healthy relationship like you would see externally. But the, it was really hard to crack that, that surface. Um, and Wendy, as Jeremy said, was very, very skilled at presenting what she would like others to see. And not necessarily showing what's going on behind the scenes unless she has an in-depth conversation. And she did that only with select people. Now, Karma, our, our world is doomed because that kind of behavior is now amplified by a million, if not more, on social media with everyone now, you know, pretending that everything is perfect all the time and uh live and that they're living in this idealistic no, I, world. I, I I don't know if I missed the uh uh this part that Tamara just mentioned, that she had her doubts before the the marriage. the marriage. I mean, he looked good on paper, a uh, law professor, brilliant, uh, and and you know it was the time for her to marry. I think her mother picked him out on a J dating site. Mm -hmm. I think that's more common than we all think. I think a lot of people, for whatever reason. <clears throat> excuse me, social pressure, parental pressure, they get pushed into marriage situations uh, and it's not always right, but obviously 99.99997% of marriages don't end up the way uh, their marriage ended up and uh, ultimately... No, this was, ultimately this was like outside of any norm. And Correct. Now, um, I'm curious, do either of you keep in touch or have you talked to the Adelsons in recent years, months, days? Tamara? Not since that, not since the memorial service now. This when? The memorial yeah. service. Oh. Yeah, same here. Um, if you guys would, you know, so I always like to include the audience, um, and there were a lot of, you know, questions direct and indirect um, from the audience to you guys. I'd like to share some of them. Um, Judy, who actually joins us uh, and has her own channel, uh, Asian American legal focus and does a great job over there. Sent a, sent us a question, um, saying to both of you, we'll start Jeremy, you first, if you read or saw any of Wendy's police interview or depositions or trial testimony, was there, what was false or incorrect to the best of your knowledge, um, from what she was saying, if there was one thing or two things, um, that stood out to you? Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I've seen clips of her, her interview, um, there, you know, just after the murder. And then I was in the courtroom both times that she's testified. And, um, I, I can't speak to that. I really can't. Um, I, there's not one thing that's sticking out to me and, and I, I just don't really want to go there. Sorry. Tamara, no worries. No worries. Uh, this is a hard question. Um, I don't think there is any one thing. Um, I think that that over the years, I've wanted to give the benefit of the doubt um, due to past friendship and due to just uh, a sense of wanting to be fair and objective. And I, I don't, after hearing various pieces of testimony, um, different things that she said, no single one thing, but it has been almost, it's, it's been impossible to maintain an objective opinion um, at this time. Uh, Jeremy, is it, 
is it surreal to you that, you know, eight years later, you know, there's been a Dateline episode 2020. There's another Dateline episode coming out. There was this podcast over my dead body. I mean, is it surreal that you're buddies with this guy and this has garnered international attention? Absolutely. Yes. And uh, I mean, it's just kind of like a movie playing out in real life here. Um, I think it's it's frustrating that it has been eight years and you know, this is kind of ongoing. Um, I'm thankful that there are you know, four people um, behind bars right now. And um, I would think that the state attorney's office here is doing a really good job of uh, you know, pursuing justice. And I'm, I'm optimistic about how things are going to shake out. But yes, it's it's straight out of something that you'd, uh, you'd pay tickets and, and show up at the movie theater for. It's nothing that I would expect to have happened to any of my friends in real life. Same question to you, Tamara. How surreal is it for you to know that this has become, you know, a, a true crime story? It's absolutely surreal. I, I've had the unfortunate experience of when I was very little, a friend of mine was murdered. Um, so I, I'm familiar with some of the media attention that can be around this, but um, you you never think it's going to be someone you're close to. And when it's sensationalized, it sounds like a story and it's someplace else, it's someone else. But when it's someone who you interact with regularly, it's a huge loss and a huge shock. And they're very real people uh, involved here. They're really very real people who've been affected in a ripple effect nationally, internationally, the children. It is all surreal still. I, I, um, I don't know if you heard this saying that, uh, uh, that, the history of the events is written by the winners uh, in, in, let's say, in wars and so forth. So uh, the, the dead have no voice to defend their side. And they are really in a very, besides being dead, just their reputation and their, their uh, uh, history is in a very vulnerable state. And I was thinking when I listened to you, you know, um, that people have to uh, protect the side of Dan Markel because he has no voice. You know, he doesn't write his histories for the last uh, eight years. Somebody else is writing his history. And I think that when Jeremy went to the trials, that was a way to give support to the, to the, to the family and to his friend, am I correct? Yes, and and Tamara has been there also, and, and you know, taking a lot of time off to be there, uh, you know, even more days than I was at the trial. But um, yes, I think it's it's really important to be there, and I think there are a couple different ways of, of looking at it. It's a great point. Um, you know, there are people in you know in the state attorney's office and across law enforcement that are pursuing justice here and so they're putting in that work uh, to kind of make sure that um you know that the, the the law enforcement side is taken care of but i think something that really hits home for me and thinking about danny's legacy um is his voice and uh nothing gets me you know broken up more than thinking about ben and lincoln and, and where they are today and how they missed out on being brought up by you know this great father this great man uh and uh, um I, I saw Phil Markell shared with me um, a couple months ago a picture of Ben and Lincoln today, and it's just so striking how different they look from when I knew them when they were younger. How, how much, uh, especially Lincoln, looks like Danny, and, and um, you know the, the young man that these guys are growing up to be. So, in thinking about your point there, I I hope I have the opportunity to sit down with Ben and Lincoln and have a relationship with them and. Uh, I hope I can help them understand uh, what kind of father Danny was and uh, help help bring back some of these memories that I'm sure that they've lost over these years, because um, I think it's really important in terms of his legacy for his children. You know, I, I on a very, very personal level, on a, on a gut level, I can relate to the loss of the father because my father was gassed in Auschwitz when I was not even five. And very rarely, I don't think about how it could have been if he. I had a very good life, but 
I I'm thinking what what I missed and how much I missed and how terrible it was that I, it he wasn't there. And you're 83 and you're still thinking about it. And yeah. I see you tearing up there, Carmen. I can get there. very emotional when I think that this family did this to these boys. Uh, if nothing else, if nothing else, what did this grandmother think? It's her grandchildren, and she's depriving them of. Even if the father were, um, it, it, many times the father ends up in a jail because he was a drug addict or something. When he comes out, he, he is rehabilitated and he takes care of his children. Even if this man was not the perfect man then, even then to kill him and deprive his grandchild, her grandchildren of, of, a, of a father. And then who, who was the father figure? Charlie. Charlie was the father figure, the the constant father figure, because, uh, th and 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 the, and the grandfather. These were the two men that were in in their lives. Well, you see the impact. Like I said, your your father was killed. What year? In 1944. And today is 2022, and yeah. you're still talking about it. So yeah, I talk, it, and and it's a very, it's not in and, the and background. And by the way, you. You know, we're getting deep and heavy here, but you admitted to me and probably making Tamara and Jeremy super uncomfortable. But that's Don't okay. worry, we only talk about uncomfortable We'll things. be making fun of each other in moments. But just uh, literally two weeks ago, for the very first time ever. Uh, no, don't bother with you that. You told me that you have anger, like you, you had, like a deep-seated anger and resentment that your father was killed, You know, and you never really dealt with it. That's after you cursed me out the four millionth time you confess to that so but um tamara i'm curious we got a great question which of course is the one i forgot to put on my notes so i'll paraphrase it it was from a viewer who said you know J uh, dan wrote about retributive justice um that was one of his things and this person is curious how you think dan would have perceived the justice system playing out in his case um you know, is it working? Is the justice system working? Is it taking too much time? What do you think Dan's perspective on this would have been? I think Dan was absolutely for justice, and he was very much uh, wanting to make sure that those who were held accountable actually were responsible. And so I think he would appreciate the time and, and care that the state attorney, the Florida Attorney General's office has put into the state attorney's office, I should say, has put into this. Um, it's taken a long time. I mean, it has. Uh, but if someone, you know, I, again, I think his mind was always wanting to believe the best in people. And if someone who had committed a criminal act could be rehabilitated, if they could contribute back to the community, if they could be uh, reintegrated, then that would always be preferred to something that is as. Uh, Steve Epstein's book title says extreme punishment. Um, you know, that being said, I, I think there's a sentiment that maybe, you know, we wish it would be moving faster, but there's a lot of gratitude for, for the time and attention that's been put into this particular prosecution. And Jeremy, this is not an easy question either. And I understand that's a difficult topic and some of the questions are difficult, but we all know Charlie's awaiting trial for murder. Um, do you either want or believe that Donna Harvey, Wendy, will be indicted for this crime as well? That is a hard question. Um, I just, I, I don't know enough to know, and I've kind of gone back and forth in my mind about what Wendy knew, she knew it, and, and I, I just, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, and I agree with Tamara that um, you know, Danny would want um, justice served here, but um, those who truly were accountable to be brought to justice, but if they weren't, they shouldn't be. Um, I, I know that, um, for example, he was against capital punishment uh, strongly, and I, I know that uh, that was an you know, one point on the table, and I'm, I'm glad, I know for Danny's sake, that that was not uh, pursued, and that, that was you know, nothing that he would want. But um, I don't know. That, this sounds like me dodging that question. I probably am, but I, I don't know enough to know how directly responsible they were. Um, I, I that think that... You know, yes. I think you are going to get a special award from me because I think you are the first one and the only one 
who says, I don't know, I am not uh, going to pass judgment. Everybody says, Tana should go first. Uh, 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 you know, uh, Harvey, will go Harvey is guilty. Harvey is not guilty. Dana is not going to go. Anna, Anna, and you are the first one who just say, I don't know. And that's a very noble thing. I never bring myself to the point of being able to say, I don't know, ask Joel. But, but I don't know is a very honorable answer because everybody else is like quarterbacking, you know, trying to figure out... Uh, what to do, and you are the only one who said, I really don't know. So let's see if Tamara is <laughs> well, quarterbacking. Is- <laughs> no, now Tamara is in a bad spot. She's an attorney. Yeah, you're an attorney, so you might have a different, but same question to you. <laughs> do you either want or think that Wendy, Donna, Harvey will be indicted uh, for this crime? So because I'm an attorney, I'm going to very literally take your question word for word there. <laughs> um, I think, you know, Carm, I think I'll be the second person to say I don't know. Um, my personal opinions are my subjective opinions based on my observations personally, things I've come to learn and understand over time, both back then and, and over time now, and behaviors of people since those times. I know what I now would, would like to happen, but that is not necessarily what will or may happen. Um, and I, I think I'll leave that comment there. Okay. I was going to push you to share, but I won't. I will respect you on this day, and uh, we won't go there. So we have another comment here. I thought this was interesting um, from Angela. She writes, John Singer, who's an attorney who appears on our show quite often. He didn't go to Harvard, John. Failure, but he, he did go to Georgetown, so he's, he's all right. So <laughs> John will accept that. Very insecure boy. Um, John Singer is correct. Wendy, uh, Angela writes, the shots Wendy took from the witness stand against Dan tells a jury everything they need to know. Her animosity towards Dan started the ball rolling with her mom, dad, and brother to kill Dan because she is not a fighter. She's a passive aggressive manipulator who got the family to do the deadly deed. Wendy's shots against Dan are precisely what will get her and her family convicted. Now, I don't want you to necessarily respond to that, but what I was curious about, did you find her to be passive aggressive? Would she manipulate Dan in that way? Because in, in Extreme Punishment, it talks about how she would give him the silent treatment a lot. Did either of you observe that, Jeremy? Yes. <laughs> Simple answer. Yes. The answer yes. is yes. And she also, I mean, she was... I know it was really frustrating through the divorce proceedings. Danny would want to sort things out by phone and she, and we kept on directing him to talk to her lawyer. And it was silly things that, you know, if two adults, you know, talked to her and talked for 30 seconds, they could have resolved. And instead, Wendy was refusing to talk to him. And, you know, she, she also, as a friend would often, you know, you know, ghost us or, you know, be vague about her plans or whether or not she was going to join or what, you know, and uh, yeah, she definitely has that in her to be both passive aggressive and, uh, only provide the information she wants to provide when she wants to provide it, withhold everything else. And it's, it can be a little manipulative and a little frustrating. And this isn't really a question, but uh, Five Car is a very, Five Car Five is his name on YouTube, and he's a very smart guy, astute. He picks up a lot of points. Um, he writes, when Wendy was sitting there with Isom, who's the investigator, after listening to the voicemail, he asked for her ID. She never says what's going on. This is obviously right after the, the murder. Uh, she never says what's going on or how does this involve me? After her fake crying, she says, Danny didn't treat me very well. And I have lots of friends and I hope someone didn't do this for me. Why didn't she think it was a carjacking or robbery or random shooting? No, it was someone that wanted to hurt Dan. And I bring this up because obviously the comment includes friends like you possibly doing something, which we know is ludicrous. Um, but more so, it's kind of what Carm was talking about, my dear mother. It seems like everyone has an opinion on this case. I mean, Jeremy, today in Tallahassee, people are still talking about it. People still ask you what you think, and, and this comes up often in conversation. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's something that kind of simmers down a little bit, and then you know, when a trial's 
uh, ramping up again, then it's a really, really hot topic. But yes, it's never gone away in eight years since they passed. And same to you, Tamara. Do you find yourself getting in conversations about this frequently, just, you know, at the supermarket or yoga class or whatever you're doing? I do. And, and even new friends that I had, didn't think had anything to do with it or knew about it. And I, I actually don't live in Tallahassee anymore. So I have people who, when they find out that I, I knew any, uh, they happen to know all about the case. Sometimes they know more about the case than I do, because for me, it's, it's still a little painful to listen to some of the details um, of the case. So I, I'm constantly surprised by how much interest this has generated just all over the place. It, it doesn't seem to go away. And I think it makes it really difficult for, for survivors, for friends, for family to feel like there's closure because it's, it's constantly a wound that's being reopened again and again and again. Um, and sometimes salt is being poured in the wound as well. So it continues. And I think until there is some sense of justice, and that's, that's, the, that's why I went to the, the trial for the first time, um, I was able to finally feel like justice was in progress. And I think until there is full justice in this case, there will not be full closure. Uh, before getting to one or two last comments, um, we've had Ruth Markell on the show a couple of times, most recently to talk about parents' rights. With, uh, you know, she, along with Cyphers, the uh, Dan Markell, guys uh, in the state of Florida, text uh, grammar to some extent. What do you think about Ruth? Has her book out, The Unveiling? Um, she's very smart, like, uh, and a brilliant woman. What, what do you think she's handled all this? I think she has been very brave and vulnerable with what she's been going through. I, I haven't had a chance to read her book. I've skimmed it. Um, some of it seems to be a little too painful for me to read still. But she has just been a champion to keep going and, and with people in the community who have supported her. I want to see her be able to see her grandchildren. Um, they deserve to have some piece of that family in their lives. And I think it's been a long road and, and a very sad separation to lose grandchildren on top of losing a child for her. So I think she's been been very brave and, and very constant and um, and honest. She's she's dealt with this very well for the circumstances. Interesting. So obviously this is very raw emotionally for you still. Um, I take it you're, you're not going to read a book like Extreme Punishment. Do you, do you not watch the Datelines? Do you not listen to the Wondery podcasts um, because it's too difficult? I have not listened to the podcast. I watched uh, part of the Dateline. I've skimmed Ruth's book. I did um, talk to Steve Epstein just to help him with some photos, but I did an interview with him. I believe that my name is mentioned someplace in the book, but again, I haven't. I don't think it's out yet, or maybe it's out today. Um, I, I can take it for a little pieces of time, but I feel like because of having spent time with Wendy's family and other people in the situation, it's very difficult to, to bring myself back into those moments. And so initially I, I try to avoid thinking about it when it gets to be too painful. I can take it in small bursts of time, but if I think about it too much, it does bring me back there. And uh, Steve Epstein will thank you. The book uh, Extreme Punishment mm -hmm. is out today on Dan's birthday. Uh, Jeremy, uh, to you, same question. I mean, what what about the grace of Ruth Markell and the rest of the family in light of all that's happened? You know, Ruth is is just incredible. She's a she, you know I just cannot imagine the level of grief that um, she's experienced. And same with Phil, and you know, for it to be ongoing and. For, and it's impossible for this wound to ever, well, ever fully heal, but really you know, heal to a, to a level that um, you know, she's able to move on because it keeps on getting kind of revisited and all these cases keep on coming up and new news keep on coming up. And um, I really admire how she's she's fought. Uh, I think Tamara expressed uh, that really well about Ruth and what kind of a, a powerful force she is. Um, this grandparents' rights thing is it, it's just, it's so frustrating to think about the idea of, uh, Ruth and Phil being denied access to their grandchildren um, by the Adelson family. I think it's just that that's that's another crime. And um, I really admire the way that 
uh, they've gone after it. I appreciate the Florida legislature for finally uh, you know, passing the Stan Markell Act and helping to open the door to them getting you know, legal access to their, their grandkids again. I think it's really important for Ben and Lincoln to know uh, you know, Ruth and Phil and Shelly and, and be in, in their lives. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate Ruth's uh, constant advocacy uh, to help make that happen as well as some other folks like Karen Cyphers. Uh, but yeah, Ruth is, is an inspiration. It, it, there's no easy way to deal with you know, the, the loss of a child, but I think she's, she's done it as well as could possibly be imagined. Um, I, uh, from one grandmother to another grandmother, I want to tell Ruth that I'm thinking of her and I don't like when people say she is so strong. She is just, she, ha she has to continue. She has to be there. She has unfinished hopes for the children, but it's, it's not even, it's, it's virtually impossible to be so strong. And she even had heart problems. You know, her heart is broken. I don't know if you know this, but she, she mentioned it in the book. So it's, it's, Okay, too, because I read I read the book, and she has it broke her heart. It 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 must be the most incredible, unbelievable. Well, Carmen, because she know, was very lost, like Joel and I are a little pathological Carmen, because we are close. You lost no, a child but that yourself. was a little child. You that lost was, a child. No, it, you cannot compare. You cannot compare because uh, Dan was a formed, uh, warm, loving, caring, hugging son who would be in constant touch with her. They had a very close relationship. They were constantly, you know, they were on the same wavelength. You had a three-year-old. I have a three-year-old. If I lost my three-year-old, I would never be the same. Yeah, but this three-year-old was How never... How uncomfortable are Tamara and Jeremy right now? We're putting them through but the, why therapy. do you bring this up? Because you're the, it's your important three year old, because you're bringing it up. No, no, no. I'm bringing I'm, it up for her, not for me. Not, not everything is self-referenced. That baby was uh, doomed from birth. Your child is a vibrant, thank God. So you're essentially saying that Ruth is, there is no choice for her. She has to be str she strong. Strong is the wrong word. She has strong to, is strong the wrong willed. word. And uh, uh, no, she has to continue. She has to continue. She cannot just fold over and die. It's like she, she needs to do well, this. Well, she has a lot of purpose now, and obviously her grandchildren are um, among the biggest, and we're going to end up with that. One more comment here, and then I'm going to ask you one more uncomfortable question because it hasn't <laughs> been uncomfortable enough, and then we'll uh, thank you and There's nothing uncomfortable. Goodbye, we discussed all this so many times before. So, so Sally writes, the Adelsons would never have been involved in having Dan killed without Wendy's consent because it seems as if Donna especially Donna, always wants Wendy to have what Wendy wants. So Donna will never go against Wendy. She probably always covers for Wendy no matter what the circumstances are. So I'm not going to ask you here whether you think Wendy had something to do with it or not, but I will ask you, if you had a chance to speak to Wendy right now, is there something that you would say to her, uh, Tamara? Oh. Okay, that, that that that's. I'll give you that. It's an uncomfortable question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, a former journalist. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he worked uh, on TV for years. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't think there's one single question that I have for her. Um, there's probably one that's a one one word question. Uh, that is probably guessable or <laughs> discernible at this point. But um, I think there there would be too many questions, and yet I I don't know that any answers would be satisfactory. Um, whatever the question is, is the one so, word question why? Perhaps, presumably, okay, <laughs> presumably. Uh, but I, I will say this: you know, we we talked about um, how Wendy is able to show what she wants to show on the outside. I think she's also a trained attorney and she's also very smart. And I think that that she's able to use her words that way in, in the same way to to present what she would like. Um, and I think it's um, I think certainly for all of us who want to believe the best in people, we've hold, held on to that for a long time. But um, it's hard to do that when new things come out. Uh, Jeremy, you 
something you would say to Wendy? That is a tough question. And, you know, I think I can go down the path of, you know, why and the, and the murder and the, you know, trials and that kind of thing. But I think instead what I would uh, discuss with her is about the boys. It's about Ben and Lincoln. And that's something that she could, you know, make different choices today um, that would positively impact their lives. And I think it's really important to do that. I think, you know, these boys are going to, you know, they can Google any of this stuff anytime. They're going to know that, of course, they're curious about this. And, you know, no matter what kind of wool the Adelson families try to pull over their eyes, they still are going to you know, find out things. And I think it's in Ben and Lincoln's best interest immediately, as soon as possible, to have a relationship with, with their family, with Phil, with their cousins and everybody. And, um, and someone like me and Tamara, who you know, knew their father and, and you know, helped them understand that. And, and I think that's a really important thing for uh, them to grow up and have a somewhat you know, normal lives as much as could be possible. So that's the strongest thing I would advocate for if Wendy was in front of me right now is taking steps to uh, you know, open Ben and Lincoln up to relationships with, um, with Danny's family and friends. Amen to that. And uh, you actually kind of wound up on what I was going to end up on, which, which are the children again, which is most important. But let's let's uh, leave it with one final thing here. Tamara, I guess if you had a a birthday wish for Dan um, and by proxy his family today on his birthday, what would it be? It would be for his boys as well. It would be that they have a deep connection with that side of the family. And I think they could learn all the wonderful things about their dad and who the wonderful and the wonderful person that he was, and that his memory continues to impact lives around the world still. And um, very grateful for that today on his fiftieth birthday. And uh, Jeremy, you finally a uh, birthday wish for Dan Markell on his fiftieth birthday. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better than Tamara just did. Um, my you know, thinking about his legacy and his sons and, uh, you know, I'm wishing that, uh, they find, you know, peace and the truth and, um, you know, this, this big family loves them a lot. I know that's what Danny would want right now. And I, I will remember him as a good person. Very nice. Usually I end it with a uh, love you America today. We'll end it with a uh, love you, Dan Markell. Happy 50th birthday. We'll be back next week. <laughs>